FDR knew that without the Russians, the Americans could not beat Germany, especially if the Germans hooked up with the British. And when the Russians had gotten wind of the bulge, they had immediately come in person to warn the Americans, and Ike was in Stalin's debt for that. Gotthard had positioned his army of the Vistula on the Silo Heights, with his commanders von Manteuffel and Ernst Busse. And Gotthard had been in the Great War and had refused to join the Nazi Party, and he had served under von Kluge during Barbarossa, the same von Kluge who had committed suicide in the aftermath of the 20th of July plot. On the 16th of April, the day after Monny received Ike's written order to stop talking about marching to Berlin, a million and a half Russians attacked the Silo Heights, and Gotthard would help what was left of his men retreat away from Berlin, and he told them to go to Plern to surrender to the British. Busse had served under von Manstein and was spotted by a German pilot on the 28th of April, moving away from Berlin with his 21st Panzer Division and the 35th SS Grenadiers, and they'd gotten past Zossen 20 miles south of Berlin and were heading west, and in the next few days the German armies were splintered and dispersed and shredded with uncounted losses on both sides, creating the largest cemetery of the war, and the total deaths of both soldiers and civilians will never be known. While Gotthard had been waiting on the Silo Heights, he realized that he was missing some tanks that had just been given to General Scherner, who was one of Hitler's favorites, and Scherner had convinced Hitler that the Russians were not interested in Berlin, but would pivot to Prague to keep Himmler from joining up with Patton in Czechoslovakia. But Scherner did not know that Stalin had made a deal with Ike to keep Monty out of Berlin. Scherner had also been a favorite of Goebbels and was made the commander-in-chief of the army in Hitler's last will and testament, and Scherner would keep the Germans fighting in the Prague uprising 200 miles south of Berlin that started on the 5th of May until the Russians moved in on the 9th after Russia had signed the final peace in Berlin. The Russians had gone on the offensive as soon as base plate fa had failed, and so many Russians and Ukrainians had been surrendering to the Germans during Barbarossa that Hitler had been seriously strained to feed them, and as word got back about Russian POWs starving, the Russian army had intensified its attacks against the Germans. It was 1,000 miles from Moscow to Berlin and the American pioneers had gone 1,500 miles from St. Louis to the Oregon country, and the Russians entered Warsaw on the 17th of January after it had been destroyed by the Germans and proceeded from there to, towards Berlin, outnumbering the Germans six to one in men and arms, and the Russians were moving 20 miles a day. While Auschwitz was liberated by the Red Army, on the 27th of January in 1945, the British censors had refused to print those stories, but the soldiers in the Russian army heard about it from word of mouth. Himmler ordered that all the camps in the path of the Red Army be dismantled, beginning on the 17th of January, and over 100,000 inmates from Auschwitz were marched toward Germany, and when railroad cars became available, they could ride in cattle cars rather than having to walk. Himmler had stopped the gassings at Auschwitz on the 1st of November, the week after Monty's spectacular failure at Arnhem. But Eichmann's trains had continued to arrive, so the camps went from dreadful to worse as they had more mouths to feed, and getting food to the camps had become a real problem by the end of 1944. After the bulge failed, there had been no more hope of making the camp system sustainable, and feeding prison workers took on a much lower priority than fending off the Russian army 
and the hope for the Germans was that if the Red Army could be held off long enough, there would be no need to feed any more camp inmates, an impossible task when all civilians and soldiers in Germany were starving themselves. Since the 15th of March in 1944, Himmler had been negotiating with the Swedish Red Cross to sp send more supplies to the Scandinavian prisoners that would ease the burden on Germany. And after the failure of base plate, the theory was that if all the Scandinavians were put in one facility it would be easier to bring them food. So in preparation for the influx of supplies from the Swedes, Himmler needed to move prisoners out of the camps around Hamburg to make room for the Scandinavians, but with the chaos at the end of the war, that movement of inmates would prove to be impossible. The SS had been making money for years, releasing select prisoners primarily through the port of Hamburg, using the Bergen-Belsen camp to hold the hostages slated for release and Bergen-Belsen had been designed to accommodate 10,000 people, but had burgeoned with, burgeoned with the evacuation of prisoners from camps in Poland being overrun by the Red Army. Bergen-Belsen was further swelled by inmates from Neuengamme in Hamburg that were being shuffled around to make the deal with the Swedes, and by March... 20,000 of the prisoners from Auschwitz had made it all the way to Bergen-Belsen, and with them they brought typhus. Himmler's program had stalled for lack of transport, so he allowed the Swedes and their white buses to drive all over Germany, picking and choosing who they wanted to take back to Sweden, a dozen here and a couple hundred there, and the buses were painted white, with red crosses and would continue their rescues until the 18th of April when the RAF began strafing them, but still the white bus rescue of Scandinavians would go on. <clears throat> Moving the concentration camp prisoners around had done more harm than good as the overcrowding and the lack of transport and the ever-present disease continued to interfere with Himmler's plan and three days before the British had gotten to Ber Bergen-Belsen, Himmler's consolidations had included a train carrying 4,000 prisoners that had stopped beside an ammo train, and the ammo train was hit by an air raid, and half the cars blew up, but many people escaped from the conflagration only to be hunted down by the local police and by eager volunteer townsfolk, and the original and of the original four thousand prisoners only five hundred made it to bergen belsen alive and that would become known as the Sella massacre himmler's stated intent had been to get all the scandinavians into one location so they could be fed by the swedes before taking them to sweden and seeing the Scandinavians being given preferential treatment had caused untold suffering for camp inmates all across Germany. The survivors of death marches would arrive at a new camp, only to find no room for them, so they would have to continue on to the next camp, with many dying along the way, and more often than not, the locals would spit at them rather than offer them food or water, which had not been allowed by the armed guards anyway. Mani left the Hungarians and some SS in charge of Bergen-Belsen, and that did not go well, and photographs of the camp got out even though the British had banned publishing them. And seeing those pictures of the heaped-up dead in the camps made attention swerve quickly away from imminent victory for Monty towards immediate clean-up of Bergen-Belsen to rescue the tens of thousands still alive, less the 170 murdered camp guards and capos taken care of by the inmates. There had been only six main camps at the beginning of the war, holding mostly undesirables, and with around 20,000 prisoners each, such as gypsies and Jews and, of course, the political rabble-rousing communists. But with the war getting underway, more camps were built to house POWs collected from the battlefield. The camp system 
The camp system had grown exponentially the more money they could garner until Germany had become one big prison system with over 40,000 incarceration sites holding upwards of 15 million people and the prisoners were taken every day to surrounding factories to work and by the end of the war the seventy main camps had one hundred places each employing their slave labor the ss had charged the factories for the workers labor and then used that revenue to build more camps and when the russians reached auschwitz on the twenty seventh of january there were only around seven seven thousand inmates left and most of the buildings had been torn down or burned. The majority of prisoners at Bergen-Belsen and Neuengamme were Russian POWs, used as slave laborers, and with Himmler's peace negotiations underway, underway, it was not a good idea to give Stalin a reason to come all the way to Hanover to rescue his people. Something Monty had been sounding a warning about to Ike until it had become a drumbeat. But Ike continued with his broad front strategy rather than going along with Monty's narrow thrust up north towards Berlin. During the Battle of the Bulge, Himmler had been waiting in his Sondersuk train outside Strasbourg so he could negotiate with Patton as soon as the bulge succeeded because it was well known that Patton was a rabid anti-communist. After chatting with one of Himmler's conspirators in Hamburg on the 25th of April, Speer went up to Uten Lake one mile away from Plern, and Plern was 15 miles away from the Baltic Sea and Hamburg on the North Sea could be reached from both Plern and Lübeck through the Kiel Canal or overland a mere 40 miles from the Baltic Sea by road, because the estuary of the Elbe River cut 50 miles inland from the North Sea until it reached Hamburg, and Hamburg was 150 miles west of Berlin. Only if Montgomery spearheaded the main drive toward Berlin could the British be sure of securing their EAC zone and reaching Denmark in the process. But the Ardennes counteroffensive had shifted the Allied center of gravity away from Montgomery, while overall American preponderance, two to one in September 1944, had swollen to four to one by February 1945, meaning the power fueling a deep advance into Germany would be American. Eisenhower at War, page 665. Elaborating on the 14th, Eisenhower warned the CCS that he now considered a German surrender, quote, unlikely, close quote, and expected the Germans to prolong resistance, quote, to the bitter end, close quote, by holding out in the Austrian redoubt the North German ports, the Frisian Islands, Western Holland, Norway, the Channel ports, and the Channel Islands. Eisenhower at War, page 767. Flensburg was on the Baltic Sea coast, right on the border between Germany and Denmark, and Dernitz had his command post aboard a passenger ship called the Patria that was parked in Flensburg Harbor, and Ike had an enthusiastic spy network within Germany more than willing to tap telephone lines. Lübeck Harbor was 70 miles south of Flensburg along the coast towards Berlin and Lübeck was 25 miles away from Plern and 18 miles away from Uten Lake. And all these ports were connected by good roads as well as by regular railroad traffic, and all of them were easily accessible by a variety of aircraft. Lübeck was a Red Cross port with a permanent Red Cross office, and there were three ships in the harbor being used as accommodation ships that were full of prisoners, the Cap Arcona, the Deutschland, and the Thielbeck. An accommodation ship was a barracks or a dormitory because the ship had been deemed no longer seaworthy, but was useful as a floating hotel that easily could be converted into a prison. 
With the overcrowding at the concentration camps due to the Russian army's incursion from the east, the Red Cross office at Lübeck had been informed that these three ships were being used to house the overflow of prisoners who were destined for their new camp being built in Norway. The Deutschland was being painted white so it could be used as a hospital ship, but they had run out of paint after only painting the funnels white with the Red Cross, and prisoners had been sent aboard the Tielbeck on the 20th of April, and since then two dozen of them were dying every day. The Swedish Red Cross had been present when the prisoners were loaded onto the ships, and the Red Cross said that they had told the British about the 8,000 prisoners aboard the three ships in Lübeck Harbor. After the bulge, Himmler had worked on his plan to prepare for the upcoming battle against the Red Army, using all the rearmed German POWs to march alongside their new British allies, and that's why the inmates at the work camps had not been murdered or more easily released, because they were needed for continuing to make munitions and clothing and God knows what all to fight Russia. More than half of the worker prisoners were Jewish, not only because they were superior workers, but because Himmler figured that other rich Jews in the outside world would be willing to ransom them for big money if things went south. Speer was staying at Lake Uten, a mile away from Plern, and he could visit Dernitz every day. And Speer was with Dernitz on the 2nd of May when a radiogram came in from Bormann confirming the telegraph version of Hitler's last will and testament. And Dernitz and Speer decided that if Bormann and Goebbels showed up in Flensburg, they would need to arrest them. Speer went back to his house on Lake Uten the evening of the 2nd of May, and Dernitz went back aboard the Patria in Flensburg Harbor, and Speer would write a juicy passage about a plan he had discussed with his friends that was about making an escape to Greenland. Bombach had the use of a long-range four-motored seaplane, which throughout the war had plied between northern Norway and a German weather station in Greenland to supply the station with provisions. Bombach proposed that we use it to take me and a few friends to one of the many quiet bays of Greenland for the first few months after the occupation of Germany. Boxes of books were already packed, as well as medicines, writing materials, and a great deal of paper, parenthesis, for I wanted to start on my memoirs without delay, close parenthesis. We would also take along rifles, my fault boat, skis, tents, hand grenades for fishing, and food. Ever since seeing the Udet film SOS Iceberg, I had dreamed of a lengthy vacation in Greenland. But since Dernitz was now head of the government, I cancelled this plan with its combination of panic and rank romanticism. Memoirs by Albert Speer, page 585, and the footnote read, In those days Greenland seemed so distant and isolated that even intensive air reconnaissance scarcely seemed a real threat. The supply planes for these weather stations could carry enough fuel to fly to England, where we planned to turn ourselves in late in the fall of 1945. On the evening of the 2nd of May, Speer met, had met with Keitel and Jodel, quote, who were on the point of leaving to join their new master, close quote, memoirs by Albert Speer Ibid. So they all went to see Dernitz on board the Patria and had breakfast, and then went into Flensburg so Speer could make a speech over the radio, telling the Germans not to destroy everything, but to put their energy into reconstruction. And when Speer walked out of the broadcasting studio, he ran right into Himmler, who said, we still held valuable territories such as Norway and Denmark, he reminded me self-importantly, territories which we could regard as pledges for our security. 
These were of sufficient importance to the enemy so that we could negotiate concessions for ourselves in exchange for the assurance that we would surrender them intact. Memoirs by Albert Speer, page 586. Who knows how much of that is true, because Speer had been on a mission ever since the Scorched Earth Decree on the 19th of March, because Speer had worked so hard to build up Germany that he wanted to prevent any further destruction to its infrastructure, but his pushback against the Nero command had more likely been a condition of the proposed surrender terms with Monty, who wanted the Ruhr and all its industrial facilities kept intact for use in pursuing the upcoming continuation of the war against Russia and its Bolshevik hordes. Towards this end, the concentration camp prisoners had been brought back into the heartland, rather than their being murdered or set free, because they were needed to produce war material to fight the Red Army, and their new camp in Norway had been built by probably the worst ever Nazi, a man who'd been fired as the commandant of Auschwitz in 1943 for stealing too much Jewish gold. The prisoners aboard the three ships in Lübeck Harbor were destined for this new Meissen camp, Meissen camp, in Norway, where camp conditions were exceptionally brutal, because the Norwegians had been living in the cold for so many centuries that they had grown numb to suffering and genetically had cold hearts. The new camp commander was named Hans Aumeyer, and after being fired from Auschwitz, he'd been sent to dig tunnels for Project Risa. And in January of 1945, Aumeyer built the new camp in Norway with the help of the Norwegian Red Cross. At the end of the war, Aumeyer would be arrested and sent to Poland for trial, where he would be found guilty and hanged, and he swore to the day of his death that he'd never killed anyone in the camps, and neither had any of his men, and that there were no such thing as gas chambers. Because Russian POWs were more often than not considered deserters or traitors in the eyes of the Red Army, they had made some of the finest slave laborers and had hoped Stalin would be defeated because their lives depended on it, and so Russian POWs were second only to the Jews who feared death from the townsfolk if released from the camps. Himmler fully believed that the British would join with the Germans and that the concentration camp labor would allow him not only to continue the war against Russia, but to win the final victory. And Himmler suggested again to the Flensburg government that they all move to Prague so the British could have Hanover to themselves. An old imperial city, he urged, was more fitting as the headquarters of a government than historically insignificant Flensburg. He, admit, he omitted to add that by moving to Prague we would be passing from the spe sphere where the navy held power into the sphere of the SS. Dernitz finally cut off the discussion by stating flatly that we would certainly not continue our, our activities beyond the German borders. Memoirs by Albert Speer, page 586 and 7. The second naval infantry division had been created in March, and when Speer had given Hitler the news that Steiner was not able to get his second naval detachment to Berlin, Speer had gotten Hitler's promise that Himmler would no longer have power in the government, and that needed to be in writing. What better document to make that statement than a last will and testament? Hitler's declaration removing Hitler, Himmler 
Hitler's declaration removing Himmler would fit right in with the suicide charade, and then loyal Germans chosen by Hitler himself would be at the bargaining table, not Anglophile sycophants rewarding Churchill for having double-crossed the Fuhrer, and only good rejoicing Germans need show up for roll call when Hitler reappeared to lead them against the Russian army with their newfound British friends. Speer had been with the Flensburg government every day and knew that Himmler was thick with Monty, and as soon as Speer had returned to Hanover with the news about the fake suicide and the expulsion of Himmler, along with the decree that Dernitz and his Flensburg government were to be in charge of the plan, that quickly leaked out to Monty, and the order for the RAF to destroy a ship parked in a bay off the Baltic Sea went forth. Sink the Patria! The Nazi government is on board and planning to escape to Argentina. There were plenty of postcards around showing a three-funneled ocean liner named the Patria built in France in 1913 that had been well known for taking Jewish immigrants from Hitler's Europe to the Holy Land. And what was less known was that it had been sunk in the Bay of Haifa in November of 1940, and the sinking had not been published in the newspapers because any news that Jews were fighting back was seen as very bad news. When the British had ordered the passengers aboard the three-funneled Patria to return to Europe rather than allowing them to disembark in the Holy Land, some brave young Jewish men had blown a hole in the side of the ship rather than having to leave port, and it was still there, still sitting there, partially submerged, after 439 people had either been killed or injured in the explosion, most of them killed, out of the 1,904 people who had been on board. The British had ordered the three-funneled Patria to sail to a British island in the middle of the Indian Ocean that was 550 miles east of Madagascar instead of letting the passengers off in Haifa Harbor. But after five years of the Nuremberg Laws, seeing the Patria sail away from the Holy Land wasn't going to happen after what they'd gone through to get there. Because some news traveled more slowly in 1944, especially news about escaping Jews, the sinking of the three-funneled ocean liner Patria in Haifa Harbor had not been discussed in Nordic circles, not just because the idea of Jews fighting back frightened everyone, but because any reporting about ship movements was banned under the crime of giving aid and comfort to the enemy, with the applicable slogan, Loose Lips Sink Ships. The picture postcard of the three-funneled Patria would have been seen by more than a few in the maritime trades, or even been in their actual possession, tacked up on walls of mariners' sheds or huts occupied by seagoing aficionados. <clears throat> and while both the Patria in Haifa Harbor and the Cap Arcona prisoner ship had three funnels, Dernitz's Patria had only one. To add to the confusion, Aircraft would have had to pick out the ship from a jagged coastline in the Baltic Sea with, an innu with its innumerable bays stretching over 600 miles from the port of Danzig to the Danish Straits. And navigational aids were still primitive in 1945, targets identified by sight rather than by instrument with navigators relying on calculations done with compass and stopwatch, their most precise guesses skewed by changes in prevailing winds and the nuisance of intermittent cloud cover. The one-funneled Patria at Flensburg, with the new Nazi government on board, <clears throat> had just been built recently in 1939, and so would not have been well known or easily recognizable due to the war and all, since it had been camouflaged and kept at a heavily guarded berth at Stettin during the war. <clears throat> 
where it had been used as an accommodation ship for important Nazis. On the other hand, before the three-funneled Patria had sunk in Haifa Harbor, it had been in the business of bringing French and Italian immigrants to America for 20 years, so it was a well-known ocean-going liner that was almost identical in appearance to the three-funneled Cap Arcona, built in Hamburg in 1927, whose picture also graced countless postcards that were made for the passengers to send to their loved ones as well as for advertising purposes. The Cap Arcona had been the largest and fastest ship of her day, and her regular route in the thirties had been between Germany and Argentina. Dernitz's Patria was the largest diesel-electric passenger ship in the world in 1939, and she boasted six two-stroke oil engines with 3,000 horsepower each, and she could comfortably carry 349 passengers with 241 crew. The British would seize Dernitz's Patria after the war and rename it the Empire Wellland and they would be forced to turn it over to the Russians in 1946, where she was renamed Russia or Russia, and put into faithful service for the next 40 years. The Cap Arcona had regularly been sailing between Germany and Argentina since 1927, and she looked just like the Patria sitting half-submerged at Haifa, but not at all like the Patria being used as Nazi headquarters at Flensburg. The Cap Arcona parked in Lubeck Bay had just evacuated 26,000 German soldiers trapped in the Kurland pocket in East Prussia, after which the worn-out ship had been turned into a prison barracks to hold the 5,000 valuable slave laborers stored at Lübeck until they could be transported to Miesen camp in Norway to help stop the Russians, just as soon as Monty made the deal any day now. The Deutschland had just made ten trips to the Kurland pocket and brought 70,000 German soldiers back from East Prussia's emergency evacuation and the Deutschland looked like the Titanic with three funnels, while the third ship, called the Thielbeck, was a cargo steamship and had almost 2,000 prisoners on board. These were the best of Germany's workforce, not people Himmler would have wanted to dispose of, but trained workers seriously needed to keep the Russians out of the fatherland. The Elbe River went from Hamburg 600 miles southeast into the heart of Europe, all the way to Dresden, and from there as far upstream as Prague, and Dresden was 120 miles due south of Berlin, and 300 miles away from Hamburg. Prague was 90 miles south of Dresden, and Torgau was on the Elbe, 50 miles downstream from Del Dresden, and Torgau was almost due south of Berlin, 70 miles away and halfway between Berlin and Dresden. Lübeck was 40 miles overland from Hamburg with access to the Baltic Sea, and the Elbe River with its outlet to the North Sea debouched at Hamburg from where ships could sail up to Norway without having to go through the heavily mined Danish Straits below Sweden. The collection of the Norway-bound prisoners had begun on the 16th of April and gone on for the next 12 days. And while the ships were no longer seaworthy, the prisoners were not expendable, and so they were being held in these decommissioned sh ships decommissioned ships until they could be transported and put back to work in their new camp in Norway. And on the night of the 2nd of May, Gauleiter Kaufmann had been getting ready to surrender the city of Hamburg to the British. When Hamburg had been bombed in September of 1941, the city's Jews had been removed to make housing for people displaced by the bombing and these were the first German Jews to have been deported to Poland. 
When the firebombing of German cities began in the fall of 1943, it had been thought that the German people would rise up and force the government to put an end to the war, but instead it made them more determined to win so that monsters like the British would not be allowed to assume power over the good German people. The Cap Arcona had been named after Cape Arcona, that was the farthest point into the Baltic Sea that Germany extended, 150 miles north of Berlin and on the same latitude as Flensburg. And as soon as Monty's alarm went out on the 3rd of May to sink the Patria because the new Nazi government was escaping, the RAF immediately answered the call. Perhaps Monty had chosen Himmler over Dernitz because Dernitz wanted to surrender to the Americans. Or maybe Monty had believed that Hitler was dead and didn't know about the plan to resurrect him from his hiding out on a submarine. And maybe Monty had to get rid of Dernitz before Ike could take his surrender. But more likely, sinking the Patria with Dernitz on board had been a bid to make von Friedeberg the new leader of Germany, and von Friedeberg would die of cyanide in British custody on the 23rd of May. The weird thing about the Cap Arcona was that Goebbels had been making movies for the Third Reich to boost the Nazi message in 1943, and one of his films had been called Titanic that was about the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, and the Nazi spin on the Titanic disaster was that evil British capitalists wanting the Titanic to push forward faster had caused her demise, and Goebbels had used the Cap Arcona for the set in his Titanic movie. Monty's order to sink the Patria was instantly obeyed, and the RAF got it done before noon, or so they thought. And Monty had Dernitz's successors already in his tent, including von Friedeberg, for a televised surrender ceremony he had prepared, and the whole thing was ready to roll now that Dernitz and the Patria were at the bottom of the sea. The U.S. Air Force flew over the burning ships and sent photos to Monty's tent right away, asking why the RAF had just sunk three ships full of concentration camp prisoners, the Cap Arcona, the Deutschland, and the Thielbeck. To make matters worse, there had been another Patria in Lübeck Harbor that, harbor that day. To make matters worse, there had been another Patria in Lübeck Harbor that day, a smaller cargo ship, and anyone can imagine the confusion in the frenzied radio traffic that day, as the end of the war was in sight and the Nazi leaders were escaping on board the Patria, with young radio operators shouting to the dock workers, Is the Patria here? Have you seen the Patria? And, Yes, yes! There was the name on the harbor master's daily docket, right there in black and white, and no doubt that information was instantly crackled to the RAF pilots in their nine Hawker Typhoons coming from an air base 160 miles away, and they hit those ships with the same 500 pounders that had turned the city of Khan into craters, and they also dropped some 60 pound high high-explosive bombs. And they also dropped some 60-pound high-explosive bombs. The RAF attacked the Deutschland three times, but everyone on board her would survive, and when they came back a fourth time, the RAF sank the Cap Arcona and the Thielbeck, and German trawlers rescued the 400 SS guards who had jumped overboard wearing life jackets, while the RAF shot up the prisoners swimming in the water using 20 millimeter cannons from the nine RAF fighter planes. The Thielbeck was hit with 32 rockets and sank in 20 minutes, while the SS 
were also machine-gunning anyone swimming away from the foundering ships. And of the 2,800 people on board the Teelbeck, there would be 50 survivors. And of the 5,000 on board the Cap Arcona, 350 would survive, while all 2,000 of the occupants of the Deutschland were rescued before she capsized. The unstoppable momentum of the sinking of the Cap Arcona, mistaken for the Patria, was driven by the fact that the word Patria meant homeland or fatherland, and many historians said that the sinking of the Cap Arcona had been an attempt to cover up what had been going on in the camps, after which Dernitz could claim he knew nothing and that he was innocent and therefore was qualified to be the new leader of post-war Germany, but no. Reconnaissance flights had confirmed the presence of SS officers on the decks, who would have been ordered off the ships had it been an inside job, and the truth won't be known until the RAF records are unsealed in the year 2045. The most likely explanation remains that Himmler told Monty that because of the extant Last Will and Testament, signed and certified with three copies, Dernitz now had the sole legal power to make peace, and he was leaning towards a deal with the Americans, and so Dernitz had to be taken out immediately. Importantly, it had been directly with Himmler that Monty had made the deal at Bergen-Belsen to bypass the camp and leave Germans and Hungarians in charge. And so it would stand to reason that Monty and Himmler had been in daily communication. And the fact was that Himmler had talked to Speer in person on the 24th of April and had been at the dinner table with Dernitz on the 1st of May and Dernitz claimed to have told Hitler on the 30th of April that there was no place for Himmler within the Flensburg government, yet Speer said Himmler had showed up again the next day on the 1st of May and had then been invited to dinner by Dernitz. Himmler brought the news that Gauleiter Kaufmann intended to surrender Hamburg without a fight, a leaflet addressed to the populace was now being printed, Himmler said, to prepare the way for the impending entrance of British troops into the city. Memoirs by Albert Speer, page 584. Sinking those prison ships, accidentally or not, drew everyone up right quick, and any hope for planning or negotiating a separate peace sank with them because the confusion and the horror of it made any semblance of control or management from that point on simply untenable, and for the next thirty years the bodies and bones from the Cap Arcona and the Teelbeck would wash up on the beach at Lübeck. Perhaps Monty thought that he had just sunk the Flensburg government on the morning of the 3rd of May, and that he could now make a deal with von Friedeberg, who was the most senior officer of the Reich still standing. And maybe both Hitler and Bormann were on board a submarine, and maybe some explanation for the RAF having sunk ships full of civilians would be forthcoming, but instead, testimony at the Hamburg war crimes trials said that Germans had sunk those ships on purpose to dispose of evidence of the crime of slave labor and witnesses swore that the Luftwaffe and some U-boats had been supposed to sink the ships, which was probably just what the prosecutors wanted to hear. And all subsequent testimony was simply bent on making the Nazis look as bad as possible, and every available German eagerly jumped on into that pecking party in order to distance themselves from any culpability they may have had around Hitler's war. The week following the sinking of the Cap Arcona, 70 U-boats would surrender, and nobody asked why the Kriegsmarine would have wasted torpedoes or the Luftwaffe squandered fuel to sink those three 
prison ships when demolition explosives would have been more than adequate. Monty made a strange victory speech for his cameraman in front of his mobile office the morning he had planned his signing ceremony with von Friedeberg at his tent at Lundberg on the 3rd of May. And in the speech, he claimed victory for the British, and Monty also said, let us never forget what we owe to our Russian and American allies. As soon as Berlin had surrendered to the Russians on the 2nd of May, von Krosik had gone on the radio in Hamburg, and he used the phrase Iron Curtain that Churchill would later borrow for his anti-Russia Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri. And the next day, the RAF had sunk the ships in Lübeck Harbor, where most of the 10,000 inmates locked below decks had gone for days without food because there had been no food to give. The British had marched into Nuengama concentration camp on the 2nd of May, and reported that it was clean and empty, and that was because all the prisoners had either been moved to Bergen-Belsen or to Osnabrück, or had been put aboard the ships in Lübeck Harbor. The police chief of the Hamburg Gestapo was George Henning Graf von Bassowitz Bear, and he would claim that Hitler had ordered the ship scuttled with the prisoners on board, while some British historians placed the blame squarely on the advance of the Red Army, saying that if it weren't for the Russians prevailing after Barbarossa, the Germans wouldn't have had to exterminate their camp inmates, and they argued that if only Hitler had beaten the Russians, the concentration camp prisoners would have been allowed to live. New and Gama had been a subcamp of Sachsenhausen, where over 10,000 Russian POWs had been shot in the back of the head through a secret hole while being measured for uniforms. And the Red Army had overrun Sachsenhausen on the 22nd of April, two days after the Germans had taken 33 inmates northwest on a death march. And many prison workers died on these for forced marches, sometimes as high as one-third of them. But the German camp guards kept up the death marches because it gave them something to do other than having to report for duty at the Eastern Front. Monty had arranged significant press coverage for the signing ceremony in his tent at Lüneburg on the 3rd of May with his man von Friedeberg. But the German news broadcast called it a truce rather than a surrender. So Ike ordered Jodl and Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine Admiral von Friedeberg to, his, to the city of Reims in France to sign a surrender that included making peace with the Russians. Monty's partial surrenders had not required that Germany stop fighting Russians, and Dernitz had been holding out, not just to give Germans more time to escape to the West, but to give the Russians more time to turn against the Americans. And Stalin had paused just 37 miles outside Berlin, not knowing whether or not it was a trap. But Stalin was certain that if Georgi Konstantinovich Zukov marched into Berlin and the British hollered about Russian aggression, there was a chance the Americans would go along with rearming the German army to fight against Russia, especially given Patton's public contempt for communism that was well known. If the Americans had sided with Britain's globalism against Russia's national communism, would the British get away with switching sides in the middle of a war again? The answer became clear when Ike ordered Patton to halt 50 miles west of Prague and issued stark orders that he was to allow the Russians to march in, and Ike ordered all allies in Prague to get out gave Stalin the final go-ahead to take Berlin, and promised that the Americans would wait at Torgau, where they were already fraternizing with the Russians. Stalin ordered his final offensive on Prague on the 1st of May to begin on the 7th, and the day after Stalin's 
order went forth on the 1st of May. The new Chancellor of Germany went on the radio in Hamburg to warn about an iron curtain descending upon Europe. Stalin had done his best to carefully coordinate with the Americans, promising to begin his final offensive only after the Germans had surrendered to Eich on the 7th of May. But the citizens of Prague went ahead with an uprising on the 6th of May, that Sunday, that almost had the desired effect of getting Patton to march forward to fight the Russians. But Eich ordered Patton to stand down, and Patton obeyed. 